Hey kids cook real food, Katie Kendall here for the Healthy Parenting Connector and I figured on this last week before we take a little break for the Christmas holidays, let's talk about sweets. Let's talk about sugar and desserts and all those things that kind of, I think, stress parents out. Like especially if you're a parent, like I know you are, who wants to raise healthy kids, the question of how much and how, in what way you might restrict sugar and sweets is really, really complicated, right? And you know, my husband and I always talk about, we don't want, we don't want to create what I call the rubber band effect. Okay. You see this in um, like conservative families a lot, Catholic schools and Christian schools where kids are like, they feel really restricted and they're not allowed to do anything and they have lots and lots of rules. And then as soon as they leave and get into high school or college, boing, they are like shot out of a rubber band all the way to the other end of the spectrum and they tend to just like go crazy. And I feel like, I know that that could happen with food, especially sweets, right? If they're totally restricted, restrict, 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 restrict. And then the kids, you know, get out of the house, which starts happening at 13, 14, 15, boing! What are they gonna go crazy and binge? So I think it's a sensitive topic. And thank you very much, Kim, a good time for discussion. So first, we're going to talk about three sort of aspects of this. First, let's talk about why sugar probably shouldn't be completely unrestricted. Like there are some serious negative impacts to sugar. And so let's start out with the research and the, you know, brain based stuff. Second, I'll tell you what our current dessert strategy is. It's got some pros. It's got some cons. We've changed a lot over the years and, and I'm not sharing what's perfect. I'm sharing what we are trying right now, okay? Just totally honest. And I look forward to hearing in the comments what you're trying right now. And we'll just make this a mom discussion, right? Um, mom and dad and grandma. I mean, we're all in this together trying to raise healthy, independent adults. And then finally, we're, we're going to talk about the holidays and the special occasions and, and how do maybe those rules, if you have rules, shift at those times and what the ramifications of that might be. Okay, so step one maybe why sugar shouldn't be completely a free for all. Okay. And I've included some links, um, wherever this interview, not really interview. I'm, I'm am I interviewing myself <laughs> wherever this talk is shared, we'll include links to kitchen stewardship where we really dug deep into the negative ramifications of sugar. And also, um, another chat on kids cook real food, a healthy parenting connector on, on ways that you can slowly reduce your kids dependence on sweets, like at the palate level. Um, and oh my gosh, Kim is saying it's even worse now in the midst of COVID, all the packaged junk, because fruit and veggie trays aren't okay. Yeah, if if your, your kids are allowed to eat somewhere, <laughs> anywhere, you know, it all has to be packaged. And yeah, so there have been some wins and some losses, I think, with COVID. One win in our elementary school is no food. They're not, they're not feeding my kids anymore. There's no birthday treats. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been trying to get that to happen for seven years. And finally, you know, this terrible virus and pandemic has happened. So I'm like, well, at least there's this one little win. Maybe we can say, wow, we made it through a year without cupcakes for birthdays. Maybe we can continue. Why? Why does it bother me that kids get cupcakes in our elementary school for every birthday? I did the math once, and if you have like 24 kids in class and they all bring a cupcake for their birthday, just, you know, systematizing it, um, plus, you know, the big like holiday and end of year celebrations, that's two pounds, over two pounds of added sugar in a school year going into a child. Imagine a kindergartner, a five-year-old, two pounds is what the average adult used to eat 150 years ago in the whole 12 month year to put that into perspective. Oy. Okay. So, and, and why, why is this sugar not so good for us? Well, first of all, immunity is a huge topic right now. And, and I think it's controversial. Does sugar actually depress the immune system? But man, I have seen a lot of pediatricians I trust like Dr. Medea Saeed and Dr. Sheila Kilbane say that when you eat sugar, it depresses the immune system for the next five hours, like immediately. Okay, short term effects, as well as long term effects, because sugar is a cause of inflammation. Okay, it is not something our body needs as a nutrient. And it does tend to cause inflammation, partly because of the insulin response. And so for me, that's a big one. When kids have refined, you know, white sugar and in white flour too, their their insulin and their energy are going to spike up but then it's going to crash down because especially if you're not eating with, you know, fat and protein and fiber from like whole grains in the same sitting. And so that spike 
And that crash not only is tough for behavior, moms and dads and grandmas, I know you know what I'm talking about when it comes to behavior, but it's also really hard on our endocrine system. It's hard on the systems that produce insulin and regulate insulin. And the more our kids' bodies, particularly spike and crash and spike and crash with insulin and blood sugar, the harder their time their body has regulating blood sugar in the future. So I did an interview with Dr. Medea Saeed and she said 70% of kids have insulin resistance already. That's like the precursor to developing type 2 diabetes. Hubba what? Uh-oh. So it's definitely something that we, we do need to have some boundaries around. Um, the other the other three points I wanted to make, and there are more, um, but first of all, sugar feeds the bad bacteria. You know, we have three trillion bacteria in our bodies, more bacterial cells than human cells. If you need a little freaky Halloween type story to get you freaked out today, um, three trillion, trillion bacteria. Many of them are good. Some of them are, are bad. Our job is to create a hospitable environment for the good ones so that they can fight off the bad ones. When we eat sugar, we are creating a hospitable environment for the bad guys, for the bad bacteria, because they like to eat the sugar. Okay, so that's, I mean, for me, that's a huge reason to cut that back again. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to say out, right? We have to be realistic. I, I don't want that rubber band effect, but I do think there needs to be some boundaries. Um, and then the last two is quite simply, sugar is a completely empty calorie. It's not a nutrient we need. We need. And so especially for children who have smaller appetites sometimes um, and eat smaller amounts of food, that sugar is directly displacing some probably fruits, vegetables, proteins, fats, some, some nutrients that they need. And it's displacing them with completely empty calories. So we're not talking about weight gain here with calories. We're talking about just the kids need vitamins and minerals and nourishment. And if you're displacing it with something that means nothing to the body, or worse, of course, causes inflammation and insulin resistance and all that stuff, we are not doing our kids any favors. Finally, there's a huge mental health connection with, with sugar, white sugar and, and refined carbs in particular, where, where researchers have seen a correlation between sugar consumption and depression symptoms. And, and you know, it probably makes sense, right? We have the gut-brain connection. We know that if our insulin is spiking and crashing, I mean, in that crash, your behavior is going to, you know, you're, you're going to have a harder time regulating your behavior. And so that's definitely involved in our mental capacity, right? And, and there's also the hormones like serotonin that we need to have enough of to stave off symptoms of depression. Sugar is involved in kind of messing up that communication too. So for many aspects of our kids' lives, I do believe that we don't want sugar to be a free-for-all. Because of what I call the rubber band effect, boing, I don't think we can fully restrict sugar. Um, and Heidi Schouster, who's an eating disorders expert, who I interviewed on a, on a previous Healthy Parenting Connector episode, which we'll link in the notes, um, she said the best way to make a child want a food is to fully restrict it. She's like, parents, you, you wanna know how to create an eating disorder in your kids? Restrictive food. She's straight with that. I mean, that just kind of knocks you in the face. So it's important for us as parents not to fully and completely restrict a food because that makes it very desirable for our kids. So how do we, where do we put the boundaries and how much in flux do we put the boundaries? We know we don't want them eating tons of sugar, but how do we, how do we set those boundaries? So currently in our family, we're using um, a system that I think Think, and I'm linking this in the notes as well. I think it was Dr. Dina Rose, Dina Rose, shoot, Dr. Dina Rose, um, who, who said that we need to just integrate desserts into, into normal part of life, okay? And I, I love this explanation. She said, you know, if dessert is always the prize you get when you finish your broccoli, it makes broccoli seem less desirable and the dessert or the sweet, whatever it is, seem more desirable. Right? And so we're like literally setting these on different, you know, pedestals, the gold and the toilet bowl prize. So it's important to sort of take those sweets off the pedestal and make sure that they don't seem like the prize, that they don't seem like the best part of the day, right? That they don't seem like the only way to celebrate, for example, because that is going to cause some habits of eating, okay? Dr. Rose always talks about, we don't need to teach kids what to eat, we need to teach them how to eat. We need to teach habits of eating. And I really appreciated that. And after I did that interview, 
for a Healthy Parenting Connector episode, I said to my husband, I said, I think we got to change our dessert system. Okay, because I believe at that time we were letting our kids have one dessert a day, but it was always like after a meal. And we changed it to, you can have one, we, we call them desserts, many families call them sweets, one sweet a day, anytime you want. And it was so interesting when we first implemented this. Um, my current six-year-old, Gabe, was like four, maybe three and a half or four at the time. And and so he didn't really have a, a lot of like sweet or desserts habits. He'd really had like his first piece of candy just six months before that. And um, he started every day for the next two months with candy at breakfast with his dessert at breakfast time. It was very bizarre feeling as the adult, you know, because of course I grew up with the habit of like dessert after school, um, or not after school, after dinner, you know, for me, it was like at the end of the meal, that's my habit. And so he just, he, he'll grab a dessert any time of day. And there are some negatives to that too. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, my other kids, you know, they were older at the time. They were already in grade school. And I feel like they kind of already had the habit of, like, dessert comes after a meal. Now, they do like the system in that they can sometimes have dessert at afternoon snack or, like, after lunch, especially on a weekend. And so that's kind of nice. And here's what I like about that system. I really like that it puts the agency on the child. They get to make the choice of, of what and when um, and again like they our desserts at our house like whatever candy comes in at Halloween or Valentine's parties or parades in the summer which didn't have many in 2020 um, they each have their own like a Costco um, nut container so it's about what like eight inches tall maybe and all the candy that they own has to fit in that container if they have too much they have to throw some away um, and so again they have to manage their space but they but then they have to like budget their dessert in a way, right? They have to make decisions about when they want to have that dessert during the day. And that might include asking like, hey, is anyone like making cupcakes today? Is anyone like making something fun today? Or are we doing something fun as a family with sweets that I might wanna save my dessert for? Um, poor Gabe, when he had dessert every morning at breakfast, sometimes the whole family would have ice cream later and he'd be like, oh, you know, but, but he had to learn through that pain of like putting the dessert at the wrong time. It was super interesting. Um, most of my kids still have dessert after dinner. And, you know, I guess I, that's fine. I wish I would have been able to start this whole system when they were all really little before they had those habits. Um, Cause I think that's good. So what I like about it is it puts the agency on the kid and it, it makes them budget and think ahead and plan ahead. And that executive functioning is really, really good. What I don't like about it is that at least for, for Gabe, it's really only, it's really only the poor six year old who's I'm throwing under the bus here, but he will come up and ask us at really random times if he can have a dessert. And I think of what Dr. Rose says about habits. I know he's asking for a dessert because he's bored. And so, I'm supposed to say yes under the system, right? He gets to choose. But sometimes I say no, and I say no because I think you're bored. I say I don't think you really want a dessert. And my concern, Gabe, is that when you get bored, you think desserts or tablets. And that is literally true. Those are the two things he goes to. And anytime he's doing it completely out of boredom, I say, you know what? You need to find something, anything in the world else to do before you have a dessert or a tablet because I don't want those to be like the boredom filler go-tos, right? Because then when he doesn't have the restriction of one a day, when he's a 22 year old, if he has that habit of every time I'm bored, I think about eating sweets or I think about, you know, pooping around my time on a screen, ooh, right? So it's about, for me, it's about building habits. So sometimes we do say no. So that's kind of the, the negative part of that system. I don't know if it's perfect, for some people, one dessert a day is like way too many. You'd rather have one a week. Um, and I, I like I like when we were able to sometimes have fruit as a dessert. You know, if I was like serving the dessert, we'd have fruit as a dessert. That doesn't work as well anymore when they're picking their own. Um, ideally, people run out of candy. I don't know if that's, that's like hardly ever happens because there's always a holiday where someone's giving them candy. It drives me crazy. But that's the cool thing too. Okay, here's another benefit of this. When they can get the sucker at the bank or the sucker at the farmer's market or, you know, their teacher gives them candy treats and they know, they can say thank you and they can either eat it right then and that's their one sweet or they can take it home and then they can put it in, you know, their little candy tub and save it for another time. Does that make sense? So I do like that they can always just say, well, thank you. And we don't have to say, no, no, no. Don't feed my kids sweets, you know? It, it, so it's just a little bit more, a little bit more polite. Um, 
Valerie is asking a really good question. How do you handle the tantrums of redirecting? And I think you mean like with Gabe, because yeah, he's six. And so he's totally still in tantrum phase. Um, we, we do have a rule at the Kimball house that no crying about desserts. So if you cry about dessert, you lose it for the day. That's because that's not fair to anybody. So like we just clamp it down. I, again, I don't know if that's the best parenting, but I can't handle the crying about dessert because it makes me start to yell about how I hate sweets. Um, and I don't think my kids need to hear that. So that's how we do it in our house. <laughs> Valerie is just if you cry about dessert, boom, it's gone. Um, and, and then, of course, you get another tantrum. And so usually at that point, it's like, whoo, like you need some calm down time. And we might have to p put that child in his or her room to take that calm down time before they can re-enter the family. Um, yeah, oh, you three, five, and five years old, Valerie says. So yeah, you would definitely have some of those tantrums. And keep in mind, too, that the older kids get the more choice you can give them. But three, five, and five is a great time to sort of give them that choice. But it'll take some learning and some training of, like, what what is one dessert a day? Like, if you've had it, like, don't ask again. Um, so there's, you know, there's some training there and man, Valerie, if you can also teach your kids that like fruit is a great dessert, more power to you. I will say that my son Paul is 15 and he's, I mean, he eats like a teenage boy. So there's a lot of eating going on. He definitely has a bedtime snack every day. And if we have ice cream, he'll have ice cream. Um, but he often will serve himself a big bowl of frozen fruit at night as his, as his like bedtime snack. So I love that, that he's able to make different choices able, able to make some more high quality choices um, but sometimes we have to run out of ice cream for him to do that because he likes the ice cream too um, at his age by the way the one dessert a day goes away and we just talk about having to make you know your own decisions and know how food makes your body feel and and understand you know at that age 15 and 12 are my older two well you know we talk more with them about some of those negative effects of sugar right so that's what we're talking about today negative effects of sugar currently what our our dessert system is um and then and then just to throw out like there are there are people like if you serve a dessert like let's say you're someone who makes a lot of homemade treats which is awesome i just don't have time to do it um leah my 12 year old makes a lot of homemade treats you could you could tweak that one dessert a day system by just a lot of a lot of food experts say just serve the dessert right with the meal Right? So you have on your plate like your main course, you have your side vegetable, you have your, your raw veggies or salad, you know, whatever, whatever kind of setup you've got, and then you've got the cupcake. Or for smaller children, again, the half a cupcake, right? Because you don't want them to eat their cupcake and then not eat anything else. But that serving dessert right with the meal takes that like stigma. It's, it's like whatever the opposite of a stigma is. It takes that, that um, attraction of the dessert at the end of the meal away. It's just all food. Now I would I would do small servings, right? Especially for children. So maybe it's one piece of chocolate or maybe it's a half a cookie or you know, make tiny cookies or something for homemade. Um, but I do like that too. And I've found that again, Gabe is most likely to do this because he didn't have any of those habits built when we switched to this one treat a day system. Um, but my other kids sometimes will too. Sometimes they'll get the dessert right with their meal. And it's interesting they just all have their own personality. Some will just eat their whole meal anyway and have the dessert for last. Sometimes they'll lead with the dessert. And I think that's good every so often, even as a family, to be like, hey, let's, we're going to have our ice cream first because, like, no big deal, right? We, we don't want to create the habit that you have to end every meal with a sweet. Um, but Gabe, he'll go back and forth. He'll have, like, a bite of, of ice cream and, and a bite of soup and a bite of biscuit and a bite of ice cream. He's one of the kids who likes to eat you know, all the things at once where I have two other kids who like, they're going to finish one thing. They're going to finish thing two. They're going to finish thing three. You know, they're really like regimented and segmented and Gabe is just eat it all at once. So it's super interesting to watch. If you do nothing else with this information, if you don't want to like rearrange your whole family life, I would encourage you to just try that as an experiment. See what happens with your kids. If you serve dessert right with dinner, like even on the same plate, if you can, as long as you're, you know, kids will freak out if they're getting like spaghetti sauce on their cookie. So you've got to be careful. But um, that would be the one thing I would say to do after listening to this talk, because it'll just be interesting and just observe, like don't judge, don't talk about it. Just observe what each of your kids do um, and see what happens. I think it'll be really interesting. So we know that sugar is not good for us. We know that we do need to have some boundaries because left to their own devices, 
kids probably aren't going to make great choices because our bodies are made to crave sugar. We didn't used to have it in such big supply, you know, 100, 200,000 years ago. Um, so we do need to have some boundaries. Where should those boundaries be? I don't know for sure. At the Kimball House, we're really focusing on habits instead of, of what we eat or how much. And so we do a one dessert a day. Um, and the older our kids get, the more likely we are to say, you choose the portion. By the way, I still choose the portion for the six-year-old. The nine-year-old, we kind of have a little back and forth usually. The 12 and 15-year-old, they choose their own portions completely. Until the 15-year-old starts taking like half a box of ice cream. And then we're like, whoa, buddy, now you're just getting rude to the rest of the family. Okay, chill. Um, finally, let's talk about those holidays. Let's talk about those special occasions. Katie, what do you do when you go into a big party? Do they still have to have one dessert a day? Um, and for us, it's a no. Okay, for us, actually, one caveat to our one dessert a day is on Sunday, which is, a, you know, a solemnity. We're Catholic, and I want kids to look forward to Sunday. I want them to think of church day as the best day. And so on church day, you get two desserts. You relax a little more on the Sabbath and celebrate a little more on the solemnity. So that's always, that'll be Gabe. He's like, is it a two dessert day? Because <laughs> he's budgeting. He's thinking, do I want to have a dessert now, or do I want to wait until my siblings have dessert? He's so funny to watch his little brain process. Um, so, so we do, if we're going to someone's party or we're having a big holiday celebration or like on Christmas when they get, you know, goodies in their stockings maybe, or on like, we just had St. Nicholas day on the sixth, then they got some little goodies in their shoes. I make up my own rules. I, I say to them, you know, whatever St. Nicholas got you, it's freebie. Doesn't count as a dessert. Just eat it whenever. Of course, Gabe's eating one right away. He cracks me up. Um, we do the same thing for the stockings and honestly, here's why. It was a selfish reason because I would buy them like, like really nice chocolates and candies for, you know, some of those holidays. And then the nice stuff would get jammed in with all the Halloween candy and everything smells the same. And they would avoid the, the nice high quality stuff and go for the Starburst and the Skittles and junk. So that was for me. I decided that those don't count <laughs> because I wanted them to enjoy the nice quality stuff. Isn't that terrible? That's literally the reason I, I made that rule. Um, there's pros and cons to that too, okay? So, you know, the pro would be to infuse joy into a celebration. There, there, you, there is no one who can tell you that kids don't enjoy sweets more than broccoli. My kids love healthy food. They really do. They really enjoy healthy meals. But they will never tell you that they're going to enjoy even their favorite healthy meal more than ice cream. And that's okay. I kind of feel the same way, right? We can enjoy all the foods. So they're always going to enjoy that more. So, so why not celebrate with it? Then the con, the negative would be, ugh, are we setting up a habit so that celebrations mean not only food, but unhealthy food? I'm not really sure. I do allow more. I allow my kids to make different choices when we're having celebrations because you know what? Like it or not in our culture, celebration is about food quite often. It's often about family and it's often about community, but celebration is often about food. So I'm, I'm going to allow that to still be a reality in our household. Um, when we go to a party, you know, not so much in 2020, but in the past when we go to a big party and you know, there's the whole like buffet of all the desserts that all the people have made. Um, my older kids, I say, make your own choice, eat what you want. And, and they, one of them has, and one hasn't had that time where that child ate too much and felt it. <laughs> and so that child knows there is, there is an excess, right? There is a too much. Um, my younger kids, I'll usually say, oh, you know what? You can have, you can have more today. Like how many do you think would be appropriate for a nine-year-old boy? I'd say to John, and he might say, well, I think I would like uh, those three things, but I'm going to take a half of each one. Sometimes he'll actually say that, or he'll say, what about three? And I'm like, yeah, that's okay. You know? And then for the six-year-old, usually I have to set the number because he would say 10. <laughs> no, not 10. Um, but, you know, we, we, let, we do. We do let them celebrate with food and sort of broaden those or completely take down the boundaries just on the special days. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that even though that is setting up uh, sugar to be part of a celebration, that it's also reducing the rubber band effect, that they get a chance to feel what no boundaries feels like. And, and I do hope that all of them eat so much sugar one day that they get an awful stomach ache or they throw up and then they learn, mm, that was too much. Right? I really do want that to happen, even though it sounds crazy, because I want them to learn by their own experience, which will stay with them when they're adults, not my rules, which will not stay with them when they're adults. So that's my goal. 
as a parent trying to raise healthy and independent adults, I hope that's your goal too here as listeners of the Healthy Parenting Connector, that if you want to raise healthy, independent adults, we need to set good habits, we need to talk about food, and we need to have boundaries that are uh, the right amount of restricting versus giving the child agency and choice within those boundaries. Whew, it is tough when it comes to treats, sweets, and sugar. And my heart goes out to you because I know it's tough, but I hope I've given you some good ideas to try. And like I said, at the very least, try that thing where you serve dessert at the same time as the meal and just see what personalities you've got in your home. I would love to hear in the comments what your current dessert strategy or sweets rules might be. And I really look forward to the conversation. I'm Katie Kimball for the Healthy Parenting Connector. We're talking about sweets, treats, desserts, and holidays today. And we're taking a little break after this for the Christmas holidays. We'll be back in January with more experts who have the information you need to raise healthy, independent adults. Bye, guys. Happy holidays.